All right, thank you. It's a great pleasure to introduce um, uh, Dr. Eric Sherry from UCLA, a very, very interesting guy um, I met in 2013. Eric um, received his bachelor's degree at the, in the University of London, a master of philosophy in the University of Southampton, and his PhD at King's College at the University of London in the history and philosophy of chemistry. Uh, I'll say right off the bat that he is really regarded as one of the really worldwide experts about the periodic table, its history, and notably its philosophy. He's one of the founders of the field of philosophy of chemistry. Um, after um, his PhD, he uh, did postdocs at the London School of Economics and also Caltech. Then after briefly being a, a faculty member at Bradley University and Purdue University, he joined the faculty at UCLA. Um, early on, um, Eric was the founder, founding editor and now the editor-in-chief of a journal called The Foundations of Chemistry, which deals with history, philosophy, and chemical education. The first volume was published in 1999. Now, as you can see on the screen, there are, I think the count is 15 books um, and um, authored, in some cases co-edited, uh, A Tale of Seven Elements, which you see at the left, uh, was picked among the top 12 science books of 2017. He's published in Scientific American, American Scientist, The New Scientist. Um, and uh, he's also uh, chaired a committee, an IUPAC committee, um, that basically uh, looked at what the members of group three in the periodic table should be. And I, I guess a recommendation was made in 2021. Um, so his research involves history and philosophy as, a, as it relates to chemistry, quantum mechanics as it relates to chemistry. Um, he's done certainly a lot of work looking at the lanthanides and the actinides. So I'm really very pleased, very pleased at his, the efforts he's made to reach out to the public um, in chemistry. And so the talk today is titled A Brief History of the Periodic Table. And thank you, uh, Eric. We're looking forward to it. Thank you very much for that uh, not very nice introduction, Arthur. And thank you for the invitation to speak. I should just mention that Arthur recently published an excellent article on the periodic table in the Bulletin for the History of Chemistry. And I started a conversation with him uh, about that article and that's how, how come this invitation came about. So, so thank you, Arthur, and thank you all for, for coming here today. I look forward to questions. Um, let me start straight away. The periodic table, of course, as we all know as chemists, is, is pretty much the ultimate infographic. It's also become something of a meme. This is a term that was invented by Richard Dawkins to mean the cultural analog of a gene, something that self-replicates, mutates, and responds to uh, evolutionary pressures. Um, it's been an inspiration for artists. This is a painting, as you can see, by Blair Bradshaw. One can find these days the periodic table of almost anything you care to mention. I happen to be a guitarist, so this is one of my favorites, the periodic table of guitarists. There have been literally more than a thousand tables published in one form or another. Uh, and in all forms and shapes and sizes, there are cyclic tables, there are three-dimensional tables, pyramidal tables, stacked tables, as you see in the top right hand corner, and so on. There are giant periodic tables, such as this one in the side of a building, a chemistry department, I presume, uh, at the University of Murcia in Spain. There is the famous one in St. Petersburg in uh, outside the institute where Mendeleev worked, and so on. As you all know, 2019 was a grand celebration of the 150th anniversary, and there were meetings and celebrations held pretty much all over the world. How should we chemists react to all the attention that the periodic table has been receiving? Well, of course, we should embrace it. We should make the most of it to, in order to popularize chemistry. Um, and I just note in passing that popular books on the periodic, periodic table have now just begun to catch up with popular books on physics and biology, because traditionally, if you walked into a bookstore when bookstores still existed, 
you would find a whole pile of books on physics and biology, but very few on chemistry. Things have changed. Um, on a more philosophical note, the periodic table is, of course, the framework or the paradigm of chemistry. It is the major organizing principle. Um, one of the reasons why the philosophy of chemistry is a relative latecomer onto the philosophical scene has been the popular perception that there are no big ideas in chemistry. Of course, there are big ideas in physics and biology, quantum mechanics, relativity, Darwin's theory of evolution, but the popular view is no such big ideas in chemistry. But we as chemists know that that's wrong because there are at least two big ideas, the periodic table itself, chemical bonding. And of course, there's a deep connection between those two big ideas. Um, as Arthur very kindly mentioned, I've done my best to popularize and promote the field of the philosophy of chemistry. I'd invite you to have a look at this journal, Foundations of Chemistry, published by Springer. It is online, of course, and uh, most universities subscribe to it. And uh, of course, we, uh, we invite submissions on historical, philosophical, and educational issues. Now, just as a suggestion, what I've found over the years is that the periodic table uh, could be made more use of than it is at the moment to provide a sort of strand, a storyline to link the diverse topics that we have in general chemistry. It's been discussed for many years now how general chemistry tends to be or tends to appear like a bunch of disconnected topics. You know, we have, first of all, what is chemistry? Then we go into stoichiometry, which baffles students because suddenly they're required to have these mathematical techniques and so on. Um, my suggestion has been, and I'm beginning to work more closely on this theme, is to begin with the periodic table as discovered in the 19th century based on properties of elements and of compounds, and only then to move on to atomic structure and then explanation from the period, for the periodic table through quantum mechanics. There's a, been an, a tendency these days to put atoms first. I show here a bunch of books which literally have the words atom first as the theme of the book. Now I can see, I can see some good aspects of this because for example, it avoids doing stoichiometry at the outset and putting students off with stoichiometric calculations. On the other hand, to start with atoms, I think is a little suspect. You know, you have a situation that uh, somebody once said, I think it was Derek Davenport at Purdue University. We have a situation where students can quite happily trot out the electronic configuration for an element like chlorine, and yet they have no idea what chlorine is like. I mean, that's, that's putting the, the cart before the horse. I, I would suggest, first of all, a little bit of qualitative chemistry, let's say on the various groups of the periodic table, then the periodic table, and then an explanation for it. So not quite atoms first, although I am in sympathy with some of the ideas of atoms first. Okay, well, what is chemical periodicity? Well, we all know what chemical periodicity is, but, but it's worth examining the idea a little bit more closely. If we arrange the elements in increasing order, here I've done it according to atomic weight, as the founders of the periodic system first did. It's a simple fact that every now and then, as you walk along this element line, there is an approximate repetition in the properties of the elements, for example, lithium, sodium, and potassium. So to convert this one dimensional sequence into a periodic table, one can, as it were, snip this line with a pair of scissors and paste these various strips of paper one underneath the other. Whoops, for some reason I've clicked the wrong thing. Okay, so here's the beginning of a two dimensional, now it's a table rather than just a list. You'll notice I've stopped at manganese. Why? Well, because the very next element iron doesn't seem to fit. Iron is not an alkaline metal. 
So what did the founders of the periodic system who reasoned in, in this sort of way, what would they have done to cope with the problem of iron? Well, here's a table of Mendeleev, not his first one, but pretty much his second or third one. In 1870, what Mendeleev did was to exclude, in a sense, iron and cobalt and nickel and to banish them into this group eight at the right hand edge of the periodic table. Because after that, uh, periodicity is restored. Copper does form a plus one iron. Zinc forms a plus two iron. And then there are a couple of missing elements, which were eventually found, of course, and then so on. Arsenic is in group five, selenium is in group six. So there's this need to exclude a few elements. Similarly, he had to exclude rhodium, ruthenium, palladium, and then periodicity was restored. Now, these days we don't do that, of course. We have created an iron group, a cobalt group, and a nickel group, and we don't use, generally speaking, an eight column table, although the eight column table is perfectly consistent. It's still used in certain countries. It has even got some slight advantages in summarizing the valences of transition metals as well as main group metals together. But we use this table, right? We have no longer the need to exclude elements. However, we do exclude some elements, some really quite important elements. The F block elements have been banished as a footnote, as an afterthought in the periodic table. Can we include them into the main body of the table? Of course, the answer is yes, by going to a 32 column table. And we now do see some textbooks incorporating this table. It could be said that this is a more correct table. Every element follows every other element in order of increasing atomic number. Something that of course does not happen here, although I haven't included atomic numbers. As you know, there is a break between barium and lutetium and radium and Lorentzium. Okay. Now, let me begin my a uh, very brief history of the periodic table. Let's start somewhere. Let's start with Dalton's revival of the atomic theory and his publication of a set of atomic weights. He was the first to suggest that different elements had atoms which had particular atomic weights. He used these very fanciful um, symbols for the elements which typesetters didn't like. And it had to await for Berzelius to introduce the two letter symbols that we use these days. Two letters, of course, one letter in some cases. Two important ideas, philosophical ideas that preceded the periodic table and led to the development of the periodic table are triads and Proust's hypothesis. Triads are of course groups of three elements where the middle element, for instance, sodium in my example, has approximately the average atomic weight of the two flanking elements. And more significantly, the middle element has intermediate chemical behavior. Here for the first time was a hint of periodicity. Here for the first time was a relationship, an arithmetic relationship between the weights of different elements. There was a suggestion of some form of grouping of an underlying structure. Dobereiner discovered other triads, such as the chlorine triad, the sulfur triad, and the calcium triad. The relationship is approximate, of course. I'm comparing here the actual weight of bromine with the weight uh, obtained by taking the average. You can see that there's, of course, a discrepancy. As a result, people started to lose interest in triads. People thought it was a bit too much like numerology, and triads fell into disrepute. However, when it was discovered that atomic number was a more correct ordering principle, let's now use atomic number. And it turns out that triads are actually correct and exact. And they can't be otherwise, because when we're dealing with atomic number, we're dealing with whole numbers. So for instance, the chlorine triad, you can see that the mean is 35. And of course, the atomic number of bromine is 35. So triads have staged have staged a sort of comeback. First they were refuted and now they're back again. Here are many triads that have been superimposed on this periodic table. Um, 
shown by these strips. And there's nothing particularly mysterious about these triads. Let's take the one involving germanium, for instance. Why is there a triad here or anywhere in the periodic table? For the simple reason that if I move from silicon to an element like it, namely germanium, I have to move 18 elements along the periodic table. To reach another element, which is like germanium, I have to move a further 18 elements to reach tin. And so it's hardly surprising that germanium falls right in the middle between silicon and tin. Interestingly, if we go to the S block of the periodic table, rather than being the second and third members that belong to periods of equal lengths, namely 18 in the case of germanium and tin, in the case of the S block, to get a successful triad like the, the classic one of lithium, sodium and potassium, it turns out it's the first and second members that need to be in equally long periods. Of course, it doesn't work with sodium, potassium and rubidium. Triads alternate. Yes, it's a triad. No, it's not. Yes, it's a triad. Why the difference? This seems of a, a bit of an anomaly. We can remove that anomaly by going to a rather interesting periodic table that's being much discussed these days, which is the left step periodic table. Now, and I'll be talking more about this in a moment, but this periodic table features helium in group two, as it's traditionally known, the, the alkaline earths. And now you see that in every single case, the second and third element occur in periods of equal length. I'll come back to the left step table because of course it is controversial. The other philosophical idea that I mentioned was Prout's hypothesis. Prout was a Scottish physician working in London. He looked at the atomic weights that are, were available at the time and he noticed something fairly obvious. Many of them are whole number multiples of the weight of hydrogen. And so he made the obvious suggestion that perhaps the elements are literally composites of hydrogen atoms, Prout's hypothesis. It doesn't work in every case, as you can see, but it's highly suggestive. This idea was very productive. And as the philosopher of science, Karl Popper has said, it's not so much whether an idea is correct or not, it's whether it's refutable that's important. It's productive in its being refutable. It can be shown to be incorrect. And of course it was shown to be refuted by people like Berzelius and Starr who measured atomic weights very accurately and they found that there was a problem with high Proust's hypothesis. It just didn't work often enough. And yet Proust's hypothesis can be said to have made a comeback. Of course, in a modified sense, in the sense that all atoms are composites in the, of hydrogen and in the sense of protons, right? It's a commonly known fact. In an astrophysical sense, Proust's hypothesis returns because we believe, astrophysicists tell us, that the elements were literally formed from hydrogen and helium in fusion reactions. So both of those philosophical ideas, which contributed so much to the development of the periodic table, have this interesting history where they were first proposed, were useful, were refuted, and have now more or less come back, admittedly in modified form. Interestingly, Mendeleev, the leading discoverer of the periodic system, claimed that he disliked both of these ideas. He didn't like Proust's hypothesis because it suggested th the unity of all matter, which for some reason he believed to be rather too mystical. He didn't like triads, or at least he said he didn't like triads, because it had misled the early developers of the periodic system. It was too much like numerology. But curiously enough, Mendeleev used triads. In fact, he used triads with a vengeance because he published this little diagram in many of his papers and books saying that if we want to discover, if we want to determine the atomic weight of selenium, what we can do is look at the surrounding elements and take the average, not just of two elements, but of the four flanking elements. You add those four atomic weights, you divide by four, you get 79. Well, then, then known atomic weight of selenium was 78. This was a case where selenium, an element that was already known. Mendeleev was doing this to show the, the validity 
of making predictions of this kind. So he did use triads, even though he at other places said he didn't like triads. It has to be said that Mendeleev also rejected atomic theory, right? There are many places where he's more or less says, I do not believe in atoms. He didn't like atomic theory. He initially rejected valency theory. He didn't like the electron when it was first discovered. He disapproved of radioactivity. He didn't believe the noble gases existed when they were first discovered or that he didn't think they belonged in the periodic table. And he famously rejected electrolytic dissociation theory of Arrhenius, which may have cost him the Nobel Prize, given that Arrhenius was on the Nobel Prize Committee in Sweden and uh, put the mockers on any proposal for Mendeleev to get the Nobel Prize. Altogether, very scientifically conservative, and yet almost obsessively pursuing the idea of the periodic system. The Karlsruhe Conference was important in 1860 because of the standardization of atomic weights by the Italian chemist and physicist Canizzaro. And this pretty much opened up the possibility of the discovery of the periodic system proper. I believe, and other people do too, that this is a clear cut case of multiple discovery. Mendeleev is by no means the only discoverer. In fact, he is the sixth of a sixth discoverers. The first, without doubt, is the Frenchman, Émile Begayer de Chancourtois, who arranged the elements in a line, as I was talking about before. He wrapped the line around a cylinder, and as you move down vertical columns on this cylinder, you can get the first signs of chemical periodicity. Lithium is above sodium, is above potassium, in the next group, beryllium is slightly displaced, but that's not too bad. Beryllium, magnesium, calcium, and so on. Newlands, working in London, published this pretty respectable periodic system, which has pretty much all the information we find in subsequent tables by Mendeleev. Interestingly, he reversed tellurium and iodine. In fact, not only did he reverse tellurium and iodine, I've shown them with asterisks here, but he also changed the weights of tellurium and iodine in order to justify that reversal. Of course, that's incorrect. Heinrichs, a Danish chemist who had moved to the United States as a young man, produced this very unique uh, bicycle wheel periodic table, which again has all the familiar groupings, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, bismuth, and so on. The halogens are all there grouped together. This is a good four or five years before Mendeleev. Um, another London chemist, o William Odling, produced this table. He too has reversed tellurium and iodine while keeping the then correct atomic weights of tellurium and iodine, right? All the elements are arranged in an order of, actually uranium is also out of sync in terms of order of atomic weight. Lothar Meyer published this, among others, he was publishing periodic tables as early as 1864. He has this periodic table with 15 groups, in other words, well on the way to 18 groups that we now have. The noble gases were not known, of course, at this time. And he too has reversed tellurium and iodine as shown in the asterisks right at the bottom here. Tellurium has a higher weight than iodine, but they have to be reversed on chemical grounds. And here is Mendeleev, the sixth of six discoverers. And of course, Mendeleev went beyond the others because he made predictions and because those predictions came out correctly. I show here the three famous predictions that turned out to be scandium, uh, gallium, and germanium. He actually made a fourth prediction of an, uh, an, um, an element with atomic weight of about 100, and that took until 1937 before it was synthesized. This is the element technetium. But right there in his early papers, he was already predicting technetium. Now, there's an interesting debate among philosophers of science. This is a long standing debate about the relative value of prediction and retrodiction, sometimes called accommodation. Which of these two virtues of a theory or of an organizing principle 
should get more credit. Is it a successful prediction? Of course, successful predictions have a dramatic psychological effect. They suggest or they imply that the scientist somehow knows the future because he or she has been able to predict something that has never been observed yet. Retrodiction or accommodation of already known facts, always, there's always a suspicion that the scientist may have fudged his or her theory in order to make it come out correctly. It's a bit like a student looking at the back of the textbook for the answer and then being able to arrive at the answer. If you know what you're driving at, you could conceivably fudge your theory. But this is continually debated in the philosophy of science. Let me give you an actual example. The general theory of relativity of Einstein had two important conf confirmatory tests. One was the deflection of sunlight. When sunlight passes close to a massive object like the sun, it is deflected. Einstein predicted a deflection of 1.75 seconds of arc. This was more or less confirmed by the experiments at Eddington during a solar eclipse. This deflection is not predicted by Newton's theory. This is a genuine prediction. And because of Eddington's experiments, Einstein became famous pretty much overnight. There were headlines in the New York Times and the Times of London to say Einstein confirmed. However, Einstein's theory of relativity, general theory, also accommodates the so-called advance of the perihelion of Mercury, or rather the excess advance that Newton's theory could not explain. This amounts to an incredible 43 seconds of arc per century of advance. Einstein's theory of relativity gives you 40, almost 43 seconds of arc. Now, historians have looked into this and have claimed that this was actually taken more seriously than the dramatic prediction for the simple reason that the experiments had been conducted or the data was known. This advance of the perihelion of Mercury was known for literally 150 years. Whereas in the case of Eddington's experiment, Eddington was the only one who conducted that experiment. So there are good reasons why accommodation can sometimes be regarded as, a, as a, having greater virtue than prediction. Back to Mendeleev. I mentioned he made those three famous predictions. All three came out dramatically correct, of course, all four. But if we look at all the predictions that Mendeleev made, a total of 16, it turns out his success rate is only 50%. So if we attach importance to it, to prediction, as most people seem to do, perhaps we should also look at the failures as well as the successes. This is almost at astrological standards, 50-50. Moving on historically, um, we had the discovery of argon in 1894, which began to spell a problem for the periodic table for the simple reason that argon had an atomic weight of 40 and as such, there appeared to be no place for argon in the periodic table. There is already an element of atomic weight 40. It's calcium as shown in this corner here. All right, so what are you gonna do with, with argon? There were also other problems, whether it was monoatomic or diatomic, all gases up to that point had been diatomic, of course. And there was the major problem that it was completely unreactive, which made some people doubt whether it should even be accommodated into the periodic table. Then things got even worse because Rayleigh and Ramsey discovered helium and neon and krypton and xenon, none of which seemed to be accommodated in the periodic table. Some people even thought that this was the end for the periodic table. Of course it was not. Ramsey discovered or reasoned that you could simply create a new group on the right-hand edge of the periodic table. Here he is in a cartoon from Punch magazine pointing to his new group. And of course, Mendeleev at this point was delighted with this. And he began to say, well, look how good the periodic system is since it can accommodate this whole new group of elements. It is generally said that nobody had predicted the noble gases. Certainly Mendeleev did not predict them. 
But as a matter of fact, the Danish chemist Julius Thomson did predict them. Thomson is known among other things for this very nice uh, pyramidal periodic table that was later adopted by Niels Bohr. Here are Thomson's predictions. He predicted elements then unknown with atomic weights 4, 20, 36, 84, and so on. Here are the correct modern atomic weights of these elements. His error, his average error is just over 1.5%. I find this absolutely remarkable and I intend to look into exactly how uh, Thomson could have done this. Of course, by interpolation, by make, taking averages, uh, gaps in atomic weight, essentially. After that, I like to say that physics begins to invade chemistry. There were a number of momentous discoveries made in physics at the turn of the 20th century. In three successive years, Röntgen in Germany discovered X-rays, Becquerel in France discovered radioactivity, J.J. Thomson in England discovered the electron, all of which had a profound influence on physics and on chemistry and on understanding the fundamental basis for the periodic table. And of course, there was the work of Rutherford on atomic structure, the Curie's further work on radioactivity, including the discovery of two elements, radium and polonium. Another momentous discovery was due to Moseley, who essentially, uh, I was going to say, discovered atomic number in a way he did, but he really provided the experimental evidence for the ordering principle that became known as atomic number. Here is his famous graph of the square root of frequency of x-rays against an ordering number. There's this uh, relatively new book on, on Mosley, which uh, came out a couple of years ago. Um, this solved the problem of pair reversals, of course, because now one had a justification for making those reversals other than just that they suited the chemical facts. There's a debate currently going on uh, between Brad Ray, a philosopher of science, who has claimed that the discovery of atomic number represents no less than a revolution in chemistry, which I have responded to saying, I don't think that's the case. I, don't, I think it may have been a, an important contribution to chemistry, but not a revolution as such. And then he's come back and, and said, no, no, I think it is a revolution and, and this is ongoing and so on. Um, now, one of the other things that uh, Mosley settled, as well as the pair reversals, was the fact that before atomic number had been established, it was never really clear how many elements were still awaiting to be discovered, for the simple reason that gaps in the sequence of atomic weights are very irregular. For instance, the gap between manganese and iron, as you can see, is less than one. The gap between protactinium and uranium, however, is about seven, right? So because of this irregularity, nobody really knew how many missing elements there were. In fact, there were some which were reversed, as I've just mentioned, such as cobalt and nickel, tellurium and iodine. As a result of Mosley's discovery, it became clear that there were precisely seven elements waiting to be discovered between hydrogen and uranium, the then limits of the periodic system. And as Arthur mentioned in his kind introduction, I have a book on this subject, The Tale of Seven Elements. Uh, the late and great Oliver Sacks was kind enough to write the preface for this book. Continuing on the historical trajectory, the old quantum theory, Planck and Einstein eventually led to Bohr's uh, suggestion that the electrons were orbiting the nucleus in shells. And now one had the beginning of a fundamental explanation for the periodic system that we're all familiar with. The reason why, for instance, lithium, sodium, and potassium belong in the same column, behave chemically similar, similarly is because they have analogous electronic configurations. Then there was the discovery of quantum mechanics proper, the axiomatic version, the more rigorous version due to the various contributions, the realization the electron acts as a wave, the uncertainty principle, Schrodinger's equation, and so on. And now one had 
a more fundamental explanation for the periodic system, or rather an explanation for why the successive shells can contain two, eight, 18, and 32 electrons. Now, this is a major, major triumph of theoretical physics. Bear in mind that this, is, this was achieved by Schrodinger's non-relativistic, time-independent solution to the hydrogen atom, just the hydrogen atom, which is the only thing that could be solved exactly anyway. But there we are, 2, 8, 18, 32, the possible lengths of periods on a periodic table. Um, the physicists were very happy with this and they began to make statements such as this one. Now physics is capable of eating chemistry with a spoon, as was said by Fritz London in 1927. This is the idea that uh, chemistry was completely reduced to physics. Of course, that's not quite true because it's not just a matter of the successive closing of shells. If it was just a matter of successively closing the shells, then the noble gases ought to be helium, neon, nickel, darmstadtium, or neodymium and darmstadtium. But of course the noble gases occur when the atomic numbers are 2, 10, 18, 36 and 54. And we know the reason why, it's because the shells are not filled sequentially. The shells fill in this diagonal fashion, which is summarized by the well-known Madelon rule, the N plus L rule. Um, this is a man called Per Olof Lovdin, a Swedish theoretical chemist, who in 1969, during the 100th, 100th year celebrations for the periodic table, wrote the following passage. It is remarkable that in axiomatic quantum theory, the simple Madelon rule has not yet been derived from first principles. If you're going to talk about chemistry being eaten with a spoon, this should also be carried out in order for a complete swallowing of chemistry. In fact, 53 years later, to this day, this very simple rule has not yet been derived from first principles. Okay, let me make just a brief digression. And this is about something that comes up in general chemistry. The 4S and 3D orbital energy question. Now, 99% of textbooks or thereabouts, I haven't done a, a survey of this, claim that 4S orbitals are preferentially occupied, but also preferentially ionized in the first transition series of elements. In other words, when it comes to the occupation of orbitals, we tell our students 4S fills first, 3D fills next, but when it comes to ionization, the data is categorical. It's the 4S electrons that are preferentially ionized. Now, those two situations are simply and logically inconsistent. You can't have it both ways. If it is like this, then the occupation should not be 4S first. In fact, it isn't. A slightly better explanation is provided by looking at this graph of the 3D and 4S orbital energies which show that for potassium and calcium, indeed, 4S is occupied first. But when you get to scandium and beyond, 3D is lower in energy than 4S. So sure enough, 3D is preferentially occupied and 4S is later occupied. And therefore it's not surprising that 4S should be preferentially ionized. There's no conundrum, there's no logical puzzle. And in saying this, it means that it's not just a matter of adding one more electron to what was previously present in calcium. Right? That's the false assumption that's being made in presenting the configuration of, uh, uh, I meant to say, yeah, I think I meant to say scandium there. Calcium is argon 4s2. Scandium, one might think, is argon 4s2 3d1 but it is not. It is in fact 3D1 4S2. What's the basis of this claim? Well, the experimental evidence is irrefutable. If you look at Charlotte Moore's tables of atomic energy levels, the Bible of spectroscopists, and if you look at the spectrum of scandium 3+, scandium 2+, scandium 1, and so on, 
right? This is literally Aufbau. You can see that the configuration of scandium three plus with its 18 electrons is just the argon core. Scandium two plus with 19 electrons has this configuration. Scandium plus one has this configuration and scandium neutral has that configuration. Right? So there's, there are no experimental grounds for claiming that argon is uh, 4s2, 3d1. So of the two pictures I presented earlier, this is the correct picture. 3D is preferentially occupied, 4S is therefore preferentially ionized. Now the question arises, if this is true, which it is, why is the configuration of scandium, why does it not end with 3D3? And there's a decent answer we can give to that. The 3D orbitals are more compact than the 4S orbitals. Consequently, we can think of this as being initially 3D3, but two of those electrons quickly get accommodated into the 4s orbital in order to stay further apart from each other in order to minimize electron-electron repulsion. A more technical, a more rigorous version of this would be to compare the energies of the three competing configurations and to notice that of the other two configurations, the ones, oh, apologies for that, the, you can see that the, the two configurations that are not adopted involve this electron-electron repulsion term between electrons in d orbitals. To do it rigorously, of course, we don't just compare the energies of the orbitals. One must compare the repulsion terms, the j terms, and the electron exchange terms, or the k terms. All right, so the, 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 sh the configuration shown in black here is the only one that lacks that DD repulsion. That's why that is the preferred and most stable configuration. Having said that, what are we to make of the Madelung rule, which insists that 4S is occupied before 3D in all cases? Well, the simple answer is that, strictly speaking, this famous Madelung rule does not give the order of occupation. It does for the first 20 elements, but after that, it does not give you the order of occupation. Some authors have suggested abandoning the Madelung rule for that reason. However, the Madelung rule still gives us the overall configuration. If you're not concerned about which order those electrons came in, if we're not worried about the ionization data, then the Madelung rule works fine, with the exception of about 20 elements shown in yellow here which are different kinds of violations of the Madelung rule in that they are S1 configurations, or in one unique case, palladium, which is actually an S0 anomaly. Should we discard the Madelung rule? I don't think we should. We should maybe accept its limitations, but the Madelung rule, uh, when it comes to the periodic table as a whole, is still very valuable because there's no denying that in potassium and calcium, 4S does fill first, is preferentially occupied. So the Madelung rule still rules when it comes to the differentiating electron between any two successive atoms. The electron that differentiates between calcium and scandium is a D electron. So it does matter to the overall architecture of the periodic table, which means that the so-called Lovedin challenge to the physicists to derive this rule is still, is still important. It's not been derived from first principles, therefore one can conclude that chemistry has not been eaten with a spoon. I'll just briefly mention, because I'm sure I'm already taking up too much time, relativistic quantum mechanics, which is becoming increasingly important these days. This is the fact that when you get to high atomic numbers, funny things start to happen. This was first noticed in the early 1990s when uh, Rutherfordium and Dubnium were discovered. For instance, Rutherfordium shown here with a red arrow didn't seem to behave chemically in the same way as um, hafnium and zirconium. It behaved more like plutonium, which is some distance away in the periodic table. 
Similarly, dubnium did not behave like tantalum and niobium. It behaved more like protactinium. Interestingly, when you move to even higher atomic numbers to the element borium, for instance, 107, borium does behave in the way that it should behave. In fact, the headline in an article in Nature magazine was boring borium in the sense that this was business as usual. There was no uh, departure from expected periodicity. The element Copernicium, even higher atomic number, 112. The, this is the enthalpy of sublimation of these elements in, that, in the zinc group. Copernicium, as you can see, falls almost exactly on a straight line, which encompasses all those enthalpies of sublimation. Um, a paper I wrote in Scientific American on the periodic table, the, the editors of the journal took over and decided to entitle the paper Cracks in the Periodic Table. And they went even further. They showed the periodic table just collapsing, basically. I tried to say to them that this is not quite the case, but you don't argue with the editors of Scientific American. And, and there we have it. Is there such a thing as an optimal periodic table? I already mentioned earlier the left step periodic table, which consists of First of all, moving helium right to there on the grounds that helium has two electrons, as do those elements in the beryllium group have two outer electrons. Secondly, if you relocate the entire S block on the right hand side of the periodic table, we get this rather elegant uh, left step periodic table, which, by the way, mirrors the Madelung rule perfectly in that each period is now one of these diagonal lines. Each period represents a value of n plus L. In addition, it removes an anomaly which is present in the currently accepted periodic table shown below, in that in the currently accepted periodic table, each period, the length of each period repeats with the exception of the very first period. You see eight, eight, 18, 18, 32, 32, but the first period consisting of two elements does not repeat. Is that, is that a genuine anomaly? Is that a sign of something not quite right? Is this a bit like a pair reversal that's suggesting something deeper? Well, the, the left step table answers that question because in the left step table, those two periods do repeat. Of course, it's controversial because helium in a chemical sense, doesn't look like it belongs in that group. Helium looks like it's perfectly suited in the noble gases. However, there are now compounds of helium, at least I know of one. It's this compound that was discovered uh, relatively recently. Well, what's the date here? 2017, Na2 helium, admittedly at very high pressures. Here's another virtue, if indeed it is a virtue, of the left step periodic table. And that is that first members of groups, as we all know as chemists, tend to be, sorry, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, the first member of any group is generally not a member of a triad. However, if you look at the periodic table in the way that I've highlighted it here, helium, does appear to be a member of a triad of atomic numbers. Beryllium does appear to be a member of a triad. Why are these two exceptions? Maybe they shouldn't be exceptions. Now look in the left step periodic table in which helium is at the top of what we traditionally call group two. And you see that helium is no longer a member of a triad. And look at the beryllium group. Well, it's the same group. Um, uh, beryllium, yeah, I, I, apologies, I don't know what's going on there. Um, let me get back to the, the, the main point. The, saying that this is the optimal periodic table may not be quite the right term. Perhaps I'm saying this is the most fundamental periodic table, the most philosophical periodic table, the most quantum mechanical periodic table. Now, if you believe that deep down everything is governed by physics and is governed by quantum mechanics, which let's face it, it is, then this may be the optimal periodic table, even if it doesn't look like it chemically. Let me come to another point, and this is, I'm coming to the end now, you're glad to hear. 
the group three questions. Some periodic tables you see feature lanthanum and actinium towards the bottom of group three of the periodic table. Other periodic tables feature lutetium and lawrentium. Okay, here's an example of the more traditional lanthanum and actinium in that position. An increasing number of books are showing lutetium and lawrentium in those positions. Well, it's a reasonable question that students often ask, which is correct? Is there a correct answer to this? Um, it turns out that chemical and physical properties cannot distinguish the two options. People have tried very hard. Nor, it turns out, interestingly, can electronic configurations categorically settle that question. I recently proposed what I hoped was a categorical resolution, which was this. Present the periodic table in a 32 column format, which as I suggested may be more correct than the 18 column. And secondly, insist on an increase in atomic number across all periods. If you do that, the lanthanum and actinium option fails, quite simply fails, because if you follow the numbers there, lutetium is 71, then lanthanum 57, then hafnium 72, right? Lanthanum doesn't fit there, nor does actinium fit there. On the other hand, if you put lutetium and lawrentium in those positions, everything is okay because we have ytterbium 70, lutetium 71, hafnium 72, and similarly in the element lower down. Unfortunately, that's not a categorical arg argument because there is a third option. And this appears in some textbooks. I like to call this the split D block table in which the D block is split rather unevenly in terms of one group, the scandium group, and then nine groups. And the F block is inserted in between those one and nine. Very unelegant, not that elegance and symmetry necessarily matter in science, but sometimes they do. And then there's a fourth option. Now this one's interesting. This is the, depending on how you look at it, or depending on what you read, this is the official UPAC periodic table, which takes the easy way out because it places neither element in that space. Right? It just leaves two blank spaces and it proceeds to provide an F block, which is 15 elements wide, not 14, which upsets a lot of people. Certainly students find this odd because the F block is supposed to be 14 elements wide because of quantum mechanics. So we have a total of four, at least four options on the table. As Arthur mentioned, I was recently the chair of a working group that was set up in order to advise UPAC as to how to resolve this issue. We suggested that it should be option number two with lutetium and Laurentium in group three rather than lanthanum and actinium. Um, I have to tell you that after six years of work on this, various committee meetings and so on, when we presented this to UPAC, um, I, won't, I won't go through the details here, but UPAC basically said, well, yes, we agree with you. However, if we're gonna change group three, this requires changing the periodic table as a whole. And incidentally, I forgot to mention, on one hand, it is claimed that this is the official UPAC table. On the other hand, they go to great lengths to say, we do not have an official periodic table. We do not support one periodic table or another. We do rule on the numbers for groups. Yes, one to 18, famously done many years ago, but they do not have an official periodic table. And yet they publish a periodic table, which is headed UPAC periodic table of the elements. Now that really is sitting on the fence. So I'm afraid that we, this has not been resolved. It's been left hanging. And I'm afraid it's, I, this is just a personal opinion, which I, hesitate to say publicly, but I think they're, they're copping out. UPAC is afraid of a Pluto situation or something like it, where a major change to the periodic table occurs and everybody freaks out and says, no, no, you've destroyed my favorite periodic table. I thank you very much for your patience and please let me answer some questions, if any.
Eric, thank you very much for a really, really beautiful and illuminating talk. Um, just I, I'm raise one really quick question for you. Um, so based upon the fact that the um, Madelung model doesn't work per near perfectly, what about all these predictions by Pekka Pico about elements that go all the way up to 170 atomic number? What should we think about this? Um, one should be skeptical, although actually Pekka Pico is not using the Madelung rule for that. He's using the relativistic quantum mechanics. Right. Yeah, I was yeah. just referring to you know physics. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, yes, and he, he strangely enough happens to favor an F block with 15 elements across, which I find rather strange. And I've, I've had many conversations with him over this. So I, I don't know, it's, un, it's unresolved. So I'm sure there are other questions out there. I can't see everybody. So I would say if you have a question, offer it. Chris? Chris Bout? Yeah. Yep. Um, coming on, hi, hi Eric, a very interesting talk. Um, yeah. A, a question I have just about the, the, the general thought of development of all of the early ideas about periodic structure, if you would comment on, there's this interplay between the thinking of the conceptual structure of the periodic table and the graphical and physical representations that people were using as a means to get there. In other words, the fact that they were writing things down and rearranging things in, in different patterned ways led to different ways of thinking about the, the underlying structure. Would you like to comment on that idea? Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what you mean because, I mean, the periodic tables have changed a little bit but with things like pair reversals, but I don't think... I don't, Tell me more about what you actually mean. I, I don't get it. I'm sorry. So, so the, the, the earlier versions of the periodic table you showed, uh, people had them arranged in, uh, in the cylinder format and then in this radiated line format and then in different tabular formats. And it kind of led people to make different ways of thinking about the organization and, and just kind of like the role or importance that that plays in, in building up the conceptual structure? Um, I don't think there's any evidence that those different shapes, shall we say, or different forms of representation led to any different conclusions. I may mm -hmm. be wrong. I mean, if somebody knows of any, I think in the end, it really doesn't matter if you represent it as a spiral, as a clock, as a flat table that is a 3D pyramid or whatever, because it's the same information that's conveyed. Mm -hmm. It's just that we, we tend to favor the flat form because we can slap it in a book or on a, on a wall and it's, you know, we can't have pop-up periodic tables yet. But I'm not convinced that the actual represent, in other words, representation is secondary. What matters is that relationship between the, the elements and, and you can represent it as you like. But I'd be, I, I'd be interested in, you know, being convinced otherwise, if there are any cases where the representation led to a different conclusion. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the business about 18 as opposed to 32, as opposed to, by the way, eventually it's going to be a 50 column periodic table. The moment a, somebody discovers element 119, which is the next one on the menu, then in principle, one has to expand the periodic table to 50 columns. No one's going to do it, really. Now, that may have an influence. For instance, what I've been saying about group three is partly based on looking as I did at it. So, yeah, yeah, there is, there is something to what you say. Not so much the shape, but this argument was based on the 32-column format. So, yes, yes, okay. I, I'm, I'm now being persuaded more and more. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. Uh, other other questions? Um, I'd say just go ahead if you have a question. It, it's it's hard to control <laughs> to control the audience on the screen that I have. Uh, other questions. Um, but by the way, Eric, I very much appreciated 
uh, at least a couple of the points that you made, I've been really unhappy with the use of the term meme. And it just seems to be almost meaningless. And I think you gave it a very useful definition. The other thing is that your point about, let's say, going to Barnes and Noble and seeing the physics books, you know, on two or three shelves, you know, wide shelves, the biology books being on two or three wide shelves, and the chemistry books, you know, maybe existing on two feet of space. And, yeah. you, you know, your point about the uh, periodic table. Now expanding that—that's—that's that's a really neat point. I love it. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, are there other que are there other questions? I'm sure, I have a question, Richard. So uh, in the beginning, right at the beginning, you talked about uh, the big ideas, and you said they're they're considered to be only two big ideas in chemistry: yeah, the periodic table and chemical bonds. Um, it, is everything else? given to physics and mathematics? Is there, it would seem that transformation of matter, there are just all sorts of things that one might consider big ideas in chemistry and. Yeah, um, I, it, with all respect, I think I said at least two big ideas. I, didn't, I wasn't implying that they're the, the only two big ideas. I, I see, okay. Yeah, of course, of course. Synthesis <laughs> of new compounds is of course another big idea, but it doesn't quite have the same, um, cachet, I think, as chemical periodicity, this really still mysterious business where, as you move through the elements, they recur, approximately, but they recur. Right. Okay, thank you. Other, other questions? Feel free to jump in. Roy. Roy? You need to unmute yourself. Roy? Okay. I, I, am I coming through now? You're coming through. Okay. I, I just want to ask something general, you know, from the inorganic standpoint. It's known that every time we enter a new um, subshell for the first time, things are unusual. So the first uh, time that the P shell is entered, those elements are surprisingly small. The first time the D shell is entered, um, you get a contraction, you get poor shielding. So I wonder if you would have any predictions about what would happen when we first entered the G shell, which I think is what would happen at 119. Uh, as an analogous um, abrupt change, yes, an analogous contraction, I would, I would assume. Whether one could ever examine the chemistry of those elements is another question, but yes, well, all indications that, that a similar thing should happen. Thank you. So, sure. Other questions? Um, well, I think, um, I, I, again, I think that uh, we've really, really had an eye-opening um, and very, very, um, you know, beautiful presentation. And I uh, certainly want to thank um, Eric for, for this wonderful uh, presentation, for opening our eyes about the periodic table even further. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much, Arthur. And thank you thank all you, for Eric. coming. Um, if you have further questions, please send them to me via email. I'd be very happy to, to pursue anything else you have. Thank you, Eric. I guess, um, I guess, Meg, this is under your control to, uh, to close out. Yes, I will just close out the meeting once everyone is, is ready. If anyone 